Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Climate Virus Workshop at Lessons from COVID-19 Towards Urgent Climate Action in Canada. Before we begin here tonight, uh, I would like to start, as I should, by acknowledging that the land from which I am speaking to you today is a traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people, currently called Ottawa. As citizens for public justice, we honor their deep connection to this land and express our gratitude for the opportunity to live, work, and learn on this territory in a manner that seeks harmony with the original stewards of this land. Similarly, I would personally like to extend my respect and recognition to the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations upon whose traditional territories the city of so-called Vancouver is situated and where I was welcomed as a, a, an uninvited guest and where I grew in mind and spirit surrounded by the breathtaking nature that they have stewarded for millennia. As we reflect on the knowledge and experiences gained in this event, we remain committed to learning from and with indigenous communities and have uh, who have cared for those lands and waters for thousands of years. In making these acknowledgements, we're not just uh, saying words, we affirm our duty and responsibility to meaningfully foster relationships uh, with indigenous peoples and to continually engage in meaningful and constructive actions that support truth and reconciliation and land back, which for me personally is the backbone of truth and reconciliation, as well as justice in all of our relations. Welcome again to you all, and thank you for taking the time uh, of, our, of your busy evenings to be with us here today. My name is Mario Wahba, and I am the Climate Justice Policy Analyst and Communications Coordinator at Citizens for Public Justice. To those of you who are not familiar with CPJ, Citizens for Public Justice is a national progressive organization of members who are inspired by faith to act for social and environmental justice in Canadian public policy. Since 1963, so we just celebrated our 60th anniversary last year. Since 1963, we've been shaping key public policy debates through research and analysis, uh, nonpartisan advocacy campaigns, publishing and public dialogue. Our work focuses on three key policy areas, um, refugee and migrant rights, poverty eradication in Canada, and uh, tonight's topic, climate justice. Citizens for Public Justice is a member-based organization, so your generous donations enable us to continue to offer insightful and low barrier events, such as tonight's workshop. Finally, I would be remiss if I don't mention that tonight's event is hosted under CPJ's annual Linton environmental campaign, Give It Up for the Earth. Each year during the season of Lent, which this year is from February 14th until March 28th, so we're coming up to the end of Lent. Happy Easter, uh, everyone. Um, each year uh, during Lent, CPJ brings together thousands of faith communities and justice-seeking individuals committing to take collective action for the sake of our collective home. Give It Up for the Earth inspires participants to make a pledge to reduce their personal and household greenhouse gas emissions, commit to embracing eco-spirituality in action, and sign an open letter to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as the Minister of Natural Resources, calling for stronger federal action to hold the advance of the climate crisis. All the relevant links will be dropped right now in the chat, and we encourage you to please sign the open letter to demonstrate to elected officials that faith communities and justice-minded individuals are deeply committed to climate action. So thanks in advance, and we'll speak more to the campaign in a little bit. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming your facilitator for tonight, Julia Sterling. Julia achieved a Bachelor's of Global and International Studies with a specialization in globalization and the environment in 2021 from Carleton University. Recently, she graduated from the Master's of Arts program with the Institute of Political Economy at Carleton University in October. 
and her independent thesis research compared the rapid COVID-19 mobilization efforts to the delayed climate action response in Canada to analyze civil society perspectives about critical lessons learned and potential pathways forward for bold climate action. From this research, Julia created this workshop to share her findings and guide participants in uh, imagining a pandemic level climate action plan in Canada to motivate action uh, and, and climate policies. Julia is passionate about climate justice, alternative forms of knowledge mobilization, such as dance, art, poetry, and film, and the role that the radical imagination plays in creating a just, livable world. She is curious about how we effectively create spaces for deliberate, constructive dialogue in an, in an increasingly digital and polarized world. Thanks, Julia, uh, for being here with us today, and over to you for this exciting night. Thanks for that wonderful uh, introduction, Mario, and thanks to everyone for coming out. Um, such a such a privilege to be able to present my research. Um, the goal of this project has always been to have it be an ongoing conversation, so it means so much to me that I'm here and able to keep that conversation going. Um, without further ado, I will begin my presentation. Okay. In the fall of 2019, I took a course on the social impacts of climate change. One class, we read through the IPCC climate report in detail. It was bleak and heavy, as expected, concluding that there were about 12 years to turn things around. I was 20. In 12 years, I would be 32. I left that class feeling a pit in my heart and in my stomach and was now expected to go back to my regular routine as if this information was just another topic on the exam rather than a life-altering timestamp. This urgency was serious and sharp for me, but I returned to a world that seemed unchanged. Now fast forward a few months to March 2020. The World Health Organization announces that the COVID-19 virus is a global pandemic. We all know what follows an announcement with similarly sharp urgency that actually translated into action. There was an immediacy to the COVID-19 response that we've been told is simply impossible in the climate context. So I asked myself, as I'm sure many of you did too, after decades of sounding the climate alarm, why was there a political will to mobilize for one crisis and not the other? As a settler colonial extractive resource-based economy and top per capita global emitter, Canada has the responsibility to uphold agreed upon climate targets. Despite this, Canada's greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, making it the worst performing of all G7 nations since 2015, far from the efforts required to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming. Of its nine climate plans proposed since 1990, not a single target has been met. This is embarrassing and negligent. It also reflects a serious imbalance when we look at the scale of action observed during the initial stages of the COVID-19 outbreak in Canada. This imbalance made me question the relationship between crisis and action to think about how we can learn from one crisis and apply those lessons to the other. I really wanted to speak with people who had dedicated their careers to advocating, researching, and raising awareness about complex socio-environmental issues. My thesis asks, what have Canadian civil society organizations active on climate issues learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly regarding the role of governments in times of crisis? How can Canada's COVID-19 experience inform and reimagine a more urgent and effective approach to climate action? I selected a wide range of organizations that focus on an array of issues. I chose this group because they exist in a messy middle between the individual, the state, and the corporate world with the power to hold governments accountable, shape political identities, and ultimately critique or offer alternatives to current policy decisions. I selected some of these organizations that approach climate action from different angles. So you can see here, um, there's 
people approaching from environmental loss perspective, public health, renewable energy, indigenous land rights, policy analysis, food insecurity, and environmental campaigning and advocacy. You may recognize some of these organizations I spoke to. As someone entrenched in and frustrated by the doom and heartbreak that often comes with studying climate issues, I wanted my thesis to offer a hopeful and imaginative approach to research. I designed my interviews to center reflections and opportunities for cross-crisis learning, to reimagine what's, what's possible when we talk about and mobilize towards climate action in Canada at the scale we so desperately need. In the 11 hour long interviews I conducted, I asked participants to share their reflections about initial reactions to the scale and intensity of government response to COVID-19. I asked them if any policies from the pandemic could inform our climate response or perhaps offer warning signs or gaps that should be considered moving forward. I asked them to reflect on whether COVID-19 response fundamentally or even superficially challenged any of the core tenets of capitalism and neoliberalism. In the second part of my interviews, I conducted an imaginative futures exercise, which we'll be doing later together. It, I asked participants to freely brainstorm what a pandemic level urgent climate response could look like in Canada. This exercise was motivated by a mentor who once told me that hope can feel like an abstract concept in climate conversations. She said that desire for something better can be a much stronger catalyst for change. So I asked participants, if we dealt with the climate crisis as a true emergency, requiring immediate action, what would that even involve? Without the constraints of the current government, I encouraged them to share big ideas as if they had a room full of open hearts and minds. The results were a valiant display of the radical imagination. My participant reflections centered around four key ideas. Here's an example of one of the mind maps I created for each participant to understand and map their ideas and group it into themes. Participants really centered their reflections around the importance of social supports in times of crisis, the importance of crisis communication, the amplification of political polarization in crisis, and finally, the need for a reorientation of values. So first, COVID showed us that we rely on strong social supports in times of crisis. The government's hands-on response to COVID-19 revealed that governments can and should play an active role as a supporter of citizen health and well-being. Although this may sound obvious, we have steered so far from even expecting this from our governments in an age where neoliberalism believes a good government serves the interests of industry where its role should solely reduce barriers to the free market. Under this idea, individuals are expected to bootstrap their way to better wages, better ways of life, better health and well-being, where the benefits of the free market are assumed to trickle down to the individual eventually. With rising inequality, soaring cost of living and a bloated billionaire class, we know this design does not work. Unfortunately, this dominant idea has tricked into a, trickled into a culture in Canada that has expected very little in terms of government support and instead can support austerity measures that continuously funnel funds away from core social services like education, healthcare, favored, favoring privatization. The COVID-19 response was different. In my interviews, participants shared that there was a shift in norms and public receptiveness to accepting social support programs, like the CERB, for instance, that challenge this neoliberal ideology that values market freedom, corporate interests, and a bootstrapping mentality above all else. The government's quick, low barrier rollout of CERB really challenged this idea. We often hear governments are slow moving, ineffective, and wary of big changes and new ideas. History shows us that times of crisis have the ability to propel us to step up to the plate and challenge the status quo. What is unique about COVID is that the fear and uncertainty around our collective health and well being created an unprecedented rapid shift in social norms that opened various policy windows that were previously deemed impossible or wildly unpopular. 
Building resilience to climate disasters and mobilizing a just energy transition will require a social safety net that puts citizens' health and well being first. COVID showed that there's an appetite for change and an acceptance to a more hands on approach. COVID reinforced that in times of crisis, we spend whatever it takes, proving that when a crisis is taken seriously, money is no barrier and political will remains the biggest obstacle. As a reminder, averaging around $952 million a day, the government spent $240 billion in an eight month period in payments to individuals, businesses, organizations, and government entities for COVID-19 relief. Comparatively, over a six year period, Canada has only invested 41% of that COVID expenditure for climate action. This simple lesson, spend whatever it takes, cannot be forgotten as we demand bold climate action in Canada for a th crisis that threatens all life on Earth. The threats are unprecedented. It's time our scale of investment meets the severity of what is at stake. Climate finance is not a feel-good decision to be consulted when convenient. It is at the point where it's a matter of our survival. I invite you to think, what does the government owe us in times of crisis? And how can we find our collective power in demanding that the future, future of the masses is not being negotiated for the short-term short interests of the few? Next, I wanna talk about communication in times of crisis. If we flash back to 2020, we can all remember that updates about COVID-19 were impossible to avoid. Announcements daily about pandemic policies changing, viral um, spread, case counts, calls to action seemed to be everywhere you looked. As a result, the public's attention was activated and captivated at the national level. As concerned citizens attempted to stay informed on this evolution of an unknown virus, COVID updates infiltrated everyday life through intimate, worried conversations around the dinner table, as families and community members came into closer proximity due to mandated isolation and travel restrictions. The frequency and consistency of COVID messaging made its erasure almost impossible. Translating to a sense of urgency, sustained attention and action, even if briefly. COVID was here and now, whereas the climate crisis is still being presented as a distant concern. Over the past five years, British Columbia alone has experienced record-breaking climate disasters from dev devastating atmospheric rivers, blazing forest fires, and lethal heat domes killing 613 people over a few days. Although it's clear these events have raised citizens' con consciousness and the suffering from an, um, consciousness and concerns about climate, climate change, the link between our human negligence and the suffering from climate change remains hidden, making the visibility of the climate crisis muddy and convoluted. We have to work to make this causal chain visual, uh, visible to persuade action. Framing the climate crisis as a distant concern into com in, in comparison to COVID's sharp and acute panic it's important to note that the futurity we are assigning to climate change comes also with immense privilege. Those impacted by the worst of climate change are not afforded this luxury. From a climate justice perspective, this begs the question, who is calling what an emergency and how does that translate into action and who does that action serve? Discussing the climate crisis as a future emergency dismisses the millions of human and non-human beings currently suffering. This is the form of slow and subtle violence that we must become comfortable confronting and changing. Moving on, COVID showed that concerns for human health were a compelling catalyst for change. A lesson we can learn from this is to perhaps reposition climate conversations around the link between human health and environmental health. This approach can be sometimes understood as the environmental health nexus. It's an idea that begins to whittle down that anthropocentric colonial worldview, which means 
it, we're operating on the delusion that humans are somehow outside and above nature rather than inextricable, inextricably linked. It's a basic idea that names, rather obviously, that the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, and other aspects of the environment in which we live, work, and play all have a direct impact on our health. T participants shared some seasoned wisdom that climate policies rarely get adapted for climate reasons. For instance, Ontario's coal phase out in 2014 remains the largest reduction in greenhouse gases from a single policy in all of North America. The main strategy behind getting the support from the public to enact that policy was around the concern for the health impact of smoke in urban of smog in urban centers, particularly for children with asthma, rather than rooted in concerns for environmental protection. In a world where trust in experts is eroding rapidly, medical professionals still rank high on people's list of trusted messengers. The reality is, as we chew through the life support systems of our planet, we're opening ourselves up to more and more diseases. How can we learn from COVID messaging to reframe climate policies around the powerful message of supporting human health and well-being as well? These are not different. They move in lockstep together. Public communication and education here is critical. We must find a way to do this in ways that really resonate with people, that aren't hyper-technical or full of jargon. The COVID response did this well, at least initially. We are social beings. We need narratives that surround our values and concerns, rather than polarizing arguments that often other blame, and shame citizens from engaging in the first place. Environmentalists are exceptionally good at speaking to people whose opinions we already know. The real challenge is diversifying climate messaging to reach people outside of already pro-environmental spheres. The collective climate movement requires the enthusiastic support of the masses. We have to ask ourselves then, how can we diversify climate messaging to provide different entry points into engagement while still pull, pushing for progressive change without watering down that urgency? I say we need the artists, we need the orators, the film producers, the poets, the musicians, and above all, community spaces that are willing to mobilize. I'm committed to this idea in my own life, this idea of knowledge translation and really what resonates with people. I've tried this personally through choreography, uh, short films, and three minute, I, I did a three minute thesis com uh, competition for my thesis project. So trying different ways to really get the message across in tight, concise ways. <coughs> Excuse me. To me, it's all motivated by what moves people. A statistic has never made me feel the way art has. So how do we leverage this as a legitimate form of climate action? I'd like to share um, a brief short film that I created. Um, context is important here. I created it right at the start of the pandemic when I started this project. Um, and I'd like to share it and we'll watch it together. The last 10 months have been shaped by fear, loss, and change. Terrible uncertainty in a world that yearns to know what's coming next. The great pause that none of us saw coming. A global response that shocked us more than the virus. Collective action behind a shared goal, something we were told was impossible. Forcing us to change our lifestyles, how we think, how we behave, how we interact to look inward and take notice of the everyday bits of joy we'd forgotten, to take notice of the birds and the trees again, to take notice of the true beauty that lies beyond our perceptions of the world. The same fear we feel now for our health and the health of our loved ones is what the earth has been feeling for the last 150 years. Fear of losing entire species and ecosystems, fear of disrupting the balance of the planet, fear of the uncertain climate that lies ahead. 
Our Earth demands we stop and rethink about how we are going to move forward, how we will heed this warning and act differently this time. COVID-19 is an opportunity to change for the better, a necessary scare to show us that things must change. COVID-19 cannot be a distraction from the scale of changes we needed. There is no vaccine for climate change. There is no silver bullet band-aid solution. We need to put in the work and change the way we think. A new normal is possible. We've proven that. If we can understand that wearing a mask has the potential to save complete strangers, then changing our system has the potential to protect this planet we're lucky to call home. In this unique moment, the great pause, we can reshape our priorities. When we prioritize something, we find the money, we use the technology for good, and we come together to support and care for each other. In this unique moment, the planet demands more from us. In this unique moment, neglect and the status quo is unacceptable. In this unique moment, we cannot look away. The true cost of inaction is incomprehensible. So inaction is not an option. If you take a moment now to think about and write down some of the spaces that you occupy in your own lives and the communities you're a part of, how might you call people in to climate action? Or perhaps take a moment to reflect on what strategies or phrases or attitudes have prevented you from engaging this far? And what strategies encouraged you to return to this work and this topic? The reality is both COVID-19 and the climate crisis are forcing us to confront something very scary, which is our own mortality. It's terrifying. And that fear can cripple our spirit or fuel our fight. We must tell the truth about what is at stake. And this truth-telling piece cannot be understated. It's time our government communicates and acts in ways that align with the severity of the climate crisis instead of continuing to serve interests beyond our well-being. Climate accountability and transparency legislation is critical in regaining public trust as we communicate about crises. Next, COVID-19 exposed a vocal opposition, particularly with the Freedom Convoy occupation of the Capitol. The spirit, actions, and motives of the Freedom Convoy are mirrored in stances that delay climate action, mainly individualism, fear, hate, othering, and distrust of government. Going back to what I said at the beginning, this individualism and libertarian spirit doesn't come out of thin air. We've created this by destroying the systems that support people and allow them to have trust in our institutions to feel safe and secure and protected. People's fear for safety and security is valid, but the fear is being swayed by false solutions and xenophobic rhetoric rather than pursuit of our common human rights. Climate action demands a shift towards collective action and well-being. Participants suggested that there must be a return to healthy, deliberative, democratic dialogue across party lines to counteract the hate and division that often delays progress. I'm not undermining how difficult this is when people have structured their entire identities often around geographies and ideas and careers and political stances. Similarly to our talk about climate communication, how do we bring in what is known as the movable middle to cultivate a sense of belonging in a sustainable future we are all working towards? The hope is to shift something called the Overton window. That's the acceptable policy window that propels action, climate action, instead of clawing it back. We have to strike a balance between shifting that movable middle while still pushing and reimagining ambitious policy. The government, I believe, can play a critical role as a convener of this process by perhaps adopting a citizens assembly model that could inform climate solutions that meet the needs of diverse communities. So what could this look like? Some models involve 100 randomly selected citizens that strive to accurately re represent the demographics of a region to better understand two important questions. 
What problems are you facing and what matters to you in finding solutions to these problems? Spaces for dialogue could be an anecdote to this increasingly digital, polarized world. Another question, how do we make sure that this process is not co-opted or biased to serve corporate interests under the guise of performative community consultation? Accountability and transparency remains the name of the game. If this sounds impossible, it's not. It's been done all over the world. This model was recently rolled out in Malaysia, where citizens played a critical role in designing effective policy to build resilience to worsening climate disasters in their community. Ultimately, it's time we normalize citizens having an active say in our own futures and how they play out. This should not be a radical idea, but it often feels like a pipe dream. Before we have a slight pause to let all of this information sink in, I want to share insights from my final chapter. COVID-19 was a brief departure from the status quo, globally resulting in a abrupt social, political, economic change at unprecedented scales. The shift in norm towards valuing public health was remarkable. It represented a shift in values towards prioritizing well-being and reimagining what it means to live a good life. When I asked participants to envision what would be involved in a pandemic level climate plan, their answers centered around the dire need for a collective reorientation of values that recognizes our interdependence with the natural world. How do we in incorporate this ecological paradigm into every thread of our decision-making process? Building a code of ethics that asks, does this policy move us towards climate obligations or is it furthering us? Does this policy perpetuate or exacerbate inequity or is it reducing it? We need to break down this idea as well, this harmful dichotomy of ecology versus the economy. To remember that the economy is actually us. It's how we as a society work to produce and provide what we need, how we distribute it and who gets to decide. It's inherently social, political and ecological at its very core. We can't forget this. Examples like the donut economic model describes an economic system that centers around meeting the basic needs of people, of all people, food, water, healthcare, education, shelter, while working with the, within the ecological barriers of the planet. How can we denaturalize this linear, linear economy that we've built on that normalizes endless extraction, consumption, and waste at every phase? towards a dependable process of reuse, recycle, and repair. Participants called for a deliberate implementation of indigenous wisdom of all our relations to begin to heal and right our broken relationship with the natural world, prioritizing reciprocity, gratitude, and responsibility. This disconnection we feel is not normal. It's fairly recent, and it's making us and our world ill beyond belief. It has roots in colonial violence that aimed to break, aimed and aims to break our relationship with nature, allowing the earth to be more easily exploited and poisoned to satisfy human greed. So I ask, what would you be willing to change? What would you be willing to sacrifice individually and collectively to save everything? I believe the answer lies in questioning in understanding and appreciating the extent we are currently and continually losing and destroying. It makes us question our devotion to the comfort and the luxury of the status quo at the expense of so many lives, our own, our own included. We're in desperate need of restoring connection with each other and the more than human world. How do we tap back into our human tradition of gathering, grieving, celebrating, mobilizing together to fight for the world we are trying to create. The results of this thesis pushed Canada to treat the climate crisis with the same level of urgency and seriousness seen during the pandemic. Not to create a paralyzing short-lived response or band-aid solution, but instead to adjust our society and economy to be compatible with a healthy, just, and sustainable world we all deserve. Like COVID-19, the impacts of the climate crisis are terrifying. 
What we do with this fear in this next decade will define life on earth. The time is now to reject the familiar short-term and destructive thinking that got us here and instead move towards bettering our relationship with each other and the more than human world in ways that protect the co well collective well-being of all of creation, which is the reason we're all gathered here today. So I thank you so much for your attentiveness and I will um, pass it over to Mario for some words. And thank you, Julia, so much for those thoughtful words and for uplifting a human-centric approach to the climate crisis, which is what we often try and do here at, at Citizens for Public Justice to the best of our ability, and also for emphasizing the use of, of narratives and, and personal stories that we think that's the most effective and strongest ways to leave a lasting impact uh, with people, which, again, is, is why we're doing this. Um, Thanks for also giving us actionable models on how to defend the environmental victories that we've secured so far, uh, while also calling for more ambitious climate action in the future in what is frankly shaping up to be a politically discouraging environment where politicians are increasingly using climate action as an escape goat to scare people away from progressive policies. While it's been proven time and time again that uh, climate uh, action, climate policies, things like uh, windfall taxes uh, can actually help the current affordability crisis and save us and equity-seeking groups around the world, especially in uh, the global south, from larger environmental crises later on. So thank you again, and I look forward to the uh, more engaging part also in the second half. I will uh, just briefly speak a bit more about uh, Give It Up for the Earth here. Um, uh, I trust that many of you have heard about it. Many of you have already signed uh, the open letter, but uh, in case you're hearing about Give It Up for the Earth for the first time, it is um, a, a climate uh, annual climate Linton campaign organized by Citizens for Public Justice and for the Love of Creation, which again, I trust many of you have heard about for the Love of Creation already. Uh, members. So um, if you would entertain me, I'll just let you know a little bit more about the campaign. Um, and uh, the links are already in the chat. So you can go ahead and check out all of uh, the resources that I mentioned. Um, Give It Up for the Earth is a national faith in action campaign that raises awareness about the climate crisis and mobilizes people across Canada to reduce personal and household greenhouse gas emissions engage in acts of solidarity, and collect signatures as a demonstration of support for increased federal climate action. And when we say engage in acts of solidarity, it really primarily means with Indigenous peoples in their fight uh, for stewarding the planet. Uh, Given for the Earth 2024 includes three action, uh, three action items. So the first one is personal pledge to reduce your household um, bring your household or your personal greenhouse gas emissions. So you can do that um, on your own by uh, taking a pledge for the remaining period of Lent to give up a habit that's associated with high greenhouse gas emissions, whether for you personally or for your household. Um, and you can monitor the progress of that. And like any useful skill, it gets better with practice. Uh, a commitment to embrace eco-spirituality through climate action and by building relationships with indigenous communities on in whose traditional territories we live, work, and play. Um, so again, uh, a part of that is personal, a part of it is, is collective and provided through the campaign. Uh, you can uh, take the time to extend an invitation or, or uh, re respond to an invitation by an indigenous local group uh, in your neighborhood or in your vicinity. Go and learn more uh, about their historical and present struggles. And you can also see uh, that I think the third link in the chat is another webinar that we, CPG, hosted a few months ago about eco-spirituality in action. Um, and those of you who are Catholic might find it even more interesting because it was speaking about La Data Diem, which is uh, the recent apostolic exertion. And the third call to action is sending a letter to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Stephen Gibault, urging him to set a more ambitious climate action target 
and expressing support for a just transition towards a low carbon economy. So this is really where we get to demonstrate to uh, elected officials the commitment um, and the compassion and, and the desire of faith communities uh, for creation care. Um, as you know, um, each year, you may know this or may not, each year we hand deliver your signatures to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, but we need your voice to make our demand even stronger. Um, as you can imagine, politicians on the Hill are very busy people and the Minister of Environment has been especially busy recently. So mass mobilization is the only way we can get the attention of Minister Dubo and, and show the tremendous work, care, compassion, uh, and, and activities that these communities dedicate towards um, creation care. So, uh, oh, and then in addition to all of this, there is a range of additional resources that you will see uh, at the end of the links that you can use to also circulate the campaign uh, with your networks, friends, family, congregation. Um, I think as Julia was was mentioning earlier, friends and, and, and family, um, probably some of the most trustworthy individuals in terms of, of hearing from them and, and taking action based on their suggestions. So please do reach out to your closed and loved ones. Uh, they will appreciate hearing from you and would appreciate you circulating our resources. Thank you once again for your passion and support on this journey. Um, we're, we're proud to have you as our membership and uh, to have you come to our events. And without taking too much of Julia's time, I'll let her continue with the Engaging Imaginative Futures exercise. And I will say a couple of words at the end. Thank you. Back to you, Julia. Okay. Thanks, Mario. Um, all right. So switching gears a little um, from my presentation, um, I will sh share this graphic with you um, that I created after a sort of at the end of my imaginative futures exercise with all of my 11 particip participants. I kind of mapped out a lot of their ideas that were really inspiring. So you can start to see some of the um, some of the different themes that were coming up in my research. And today, as we gather all together, um, there's, there's lots of us in this call. So I think it's a great opportunity to try out a co-writing activity um, with a software called Padlet. So, um, I will share, or if I can get the tech team to share um, the Padlet link in the chat, or if you'd like to contribute using your own device, you can use the QR code by opening up your camera um, and kind of waving it at the screen. Um, it can take you to a, a separate screen. So I'll give us a couple minutes for everyone to try that out. There's the Padlet link Karina shared in the chat. Okay. All right, opening up our uh, Padlet here. So you'll see um, this is a co-writing space. So I've given you a prompt at the top of the screen. Um, so if we dealt with the climate crisis as a true emergency requiring immediate action after the presentation I just gave, encouraging you to be as ambitious as possible, what would that even look like? We're in an age where um, the radical imagination is going to be as, as important as ever. So I'd love to partake in this exercise with all of you to just get some ideas out there about how things could be different. Um, some prompts at the top, what societal norms and structures could change? How could governance strategies change? What institutions or industries may cease to exist? How might transportation and travel look? Uh, energy, healthcare, wealth distribution, curriculum mandates, agriculture and eating habits, waste, pr production, access to nature. Here are some ideas. Um, I've given you headings here with some guiding questions underneath um, that you can either choose to, to answer or add your own thoughts of your own. Uh, of your own. There's also um, a way to kind of contribute your own heading if um, there's something here that, that you feel isn't representative of, of an idea you're trying to share. Um, 
So I'd love for us to do this exercise together for uh, 10 minutes to share or yeah, uh, eight, eight minutes altogether because um, we're nearing the end of our time. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Mario, is it possible to do it, the music? To um, show the screen at the same time. Is it possible to freeze it on my screen? So I say it again. Is it possible to freeze it on my screen? While the music plays, or Some really great ideas so far, everyone. Investing in prevention under healthcare. Shared health models. Oil and gas reduction plans. Local food production, sustainable farming. Faith communities gathering for worship outdoors to try to restore some of that connection. Mm. Interesting policy, uh, packaging policy ideas. Excellent ideas, everyone. Incentivizing local food. Rail networks, <laughs> yes. Eating what is in season.
These ideas are incredible. Thank you for sharing. We'll do it two more minutes to get our final thoughts out. And I'll be able to save this as a PDF and share back with Mario as well, if you're interested in giving these a little finer, you know, looking over them after our, our um, chat as well. Community gardening. Hmm. Some great resources being shared too. Check out the PEI Food Exchange. Amazing work to reduce in, in uh, food inequity by volunteers. Genuine Progress Index is really interesting. Make veganism sexy. <laughs> Wow, this is incredible. Greater focus on preventative health and causes. Environmentally sound housing is important for health as well. Promote civic education, formally and informally, civic engagement. Engage our students. How are we making sure that young people's spirits are not depleted as we push to, to fight for more and more um, environmental protection? I don't want to stop this flow. And I know I, I realized we have a little bit more time than I thought. So I'll give you another two minutes to wrap up your final thoughts. Creating G green jobs. Plan for ongoing use, not planned obsolescence. Thinking of software that stops getting upgraded. Really important. That goes back into that reuse, recycle and repair mentality. Active transportation, safe cycling, pedestrian, and infrastructure. Decentering human and theologies. Hmm. National Youth Forum curriculum, how are we engaging intergenerationally? Hmm. Prioritizing action, we tend to treat all actions as equal. For example, some plastic products are, for, uh, are far more helpful and essential, but plastic water bottles or plastic toys accompanying a fast food meal are not necessary. Mm. recognize that markets are fundamentally incapable of choosing sustainability over cheap energy hence government measures are vital to this effort Well, thank you everyone so much. This is so inspiring and um, I can't wait to look at these more myself and, and share them back with Mario. Um, everyone, 
I will trust you will take your right hand and pat yourself on the back for all those contributions. Thank you. Um, I will head back to our um, presentation here to just have like a final, a couple final points. Um, so some climate resources that I always just like to share is what I've what I'm engaging with lately. Um, for you that are actively engaged in climate work, I know it's uh, very hard on the heart as well as um, just the the the, the uh, returning to the work. And so I found some comfort in this book, Warmth: Coming of Age at the End of the World. If you are interested in reading it, um, I find that the Reseed um, podcast, hosted by Ecology Ottawa's former director um, Alice Irene Whitaker, is a really awesome resource um, talking about some really hot topics on, in the climate world um, in just a, a really beautiful um, podcast setting. Climate Commons is based out of Carleton, so more specific for anyone that's located in Ottawa, but they often have um, noons for now is what they're called, and they're teach-ins that happen every Thursday. Some of them are online, so keep an eye out there, maybe sign up to their newsletter. They're always sharing some really interesting ideas that's happening locally in Ottawa and across Canada. And finally, I will say the All We Can Save project is a really awesome resource. Um, they have an anthology book that's a collection of poets, poems, um, essays, and articles. And attached to it is actually a reading group circle that if you wanted to bring some friends into the conversation through a shared artifact that you can kind of read and work through in a, in a way that's very um, laid out for you as, as read already, then I would highly recommend um, engaging with that book. I found it really inspiring and you may too. Um, Finally, just as a little post-workshop journaling exercise, if you have a pen and paper near you, I would love for you to draw these three circles. Um, I find it very intimidating sometimes to engage with climate work when it, it feels like so much is on the line, there's so much urgency, and there's so many different directions that you could take it. What has been my guiding light in this conversation with myself, at least, is these three circles. What brings you joy? What are you genuinely good at and what work needs doing? The confluence of those three ideas is going to be your sweet spot that will allow you to sustain the action that you need doing. So I really encourage you to take tonight to reflect on some of these things and see if that can influence the way you're engaging with climate um, action in the future. My final question to you is what have you learned? What have we learned from what we've been shown is possible? Thank you so much for your time and energy today. Um, my name is Julia Sterling, as Mario expressed at the beginning. Feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. Jot down my um, uh, email. That is actually not my email. Oh, boy. <laughs> I mixed up the two. I'm going to edit that right now. Once it's giving two seconds. Okay. Um, at gmail.com. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, oh gosh, we're at the start. There we go. Um, finish strong. Julia14 at gmail.com. Uh, that's my LinkedIn and my phone number. I'm very willing and open to continue this conversation. Any questions that you had about my research? Um, I'm keen to share my fulsome document with you as well. My 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 thesis that goes into a lot of the topics I talked about more in depth. Um I'm looking for full-time work now as well and, and doing these workshops for different organizations across Canada. So if this interests you and you think that this would work in the circles that you operate in, I'm very open to seeing how we can work together in the future as well. Thank you so much for your time and energy and uh, Mario for this opportunity and I give it up for the earth for the awesome um, work that you're all doing. Thank you so much. You, Julia. I think we have a lot of curious minds over here and maybe some of them would like to ask you a few questions before we let you go, Julia. Uh, so I'm conscious of that and want to open it up for a small Q&A period. Um, does anyone have any questions? I was personally curious how does um, uh, advocacy for patient care um, and against the climate crisis manifest itself 
differently? How do people get energized differently? How do they carry themselves differently afterwards? When and it, it is expressed through art rather than um, through you know appealing to people's logical thinking by statistics or facts. Um, what is the difference that you as a facilitator or organizer see when we pursue climate advocacy through art versus other means? Great question. Um, I think that uh, an interesting piece that I think is often missed, at least in like a, a Western classroom setting or in a research setting um, where it's very like fact based um, and and very kind of um, sage on the stage, someone presenting information. It's sort of like that download mentality is this idea of like being held once you have that information. And I think was most jarring for me and many others was leaving those spaces, not feeling like you have that added level of emotional impact togetherness in community to share that with and, and kind of allow that to like stir something within you and motivate action. So I think that art can provide as much as it is to initiate your interest. It can also sustain you through art based communities. Um, and I think that it allows you to kind of keep returning to it because you're acknowledging the emotional weight of the knowledge rather than just the knowledge itself, um, rather than pretending like it doesn't emotionally impact you. And I think that that's what will allow people to keep returning to this. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, and I see some questions in the chat. Lots of people um, are uh, interested in the Venn diagram that you showed a couple of slides ago. So if we can feature that once again, and if you can speak to it um, a little bit more, that would be great, Julia. Uh, yeah, one second. Here we go here. Yeah. So this is um, Ayana Elizabeth is where I got this uh, graphic from. So the, the link is there at the bottom. Um, this was from I was in a all we can save that that uh, anthology that I shared with you earlier. Um, it actually has a separate program attached to it called um, the Climate Wayfinding Program. And it's I got accepted to be one of the three Canadians on that team or within the program. It was five weeks meeting with international young climate activists. And the whole program was all about finding your path coming out of undergrad or your master's um, and how to kind of orient yourself within the climate space. Where do you belong? And um, it was really impactful to me. And this was shared in that in that uh, program. And I think it speaks to sometimes the misconception that um, you know, if you want to be an, an act, a climate activist or be taking this work seriously, then you need to drop everything that you're doing in your current life and kind of go to a climate NGO. And, and that's really not what it's about. It's looking at the resources that you currently have, the networks you currently have, where are you right now and how can you make the change and the ripples start from what is right in front of you. And also tying it to what brings you joy, I think, and what you're good at is really important because if we're doing something that doesn't bring us joy and we're struggling the whole time, how are we going to find the energy to sustain that work? And ultimately, this is this is our our life's work this next decade. So I think that finding that confluence is really important. Um, so yeah, feel free to screenshot this or um, do it in your in your journals tonight or wherever you. Um, have a space for reflection. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, lovely. And uh, it's always helpful to have this information presented with a visual aid. I think it resonates with lots of people. And thanks for all the amazing questions coming in the chat. We have a question from Marlene saying, we spent uh, presumably money on COVID because it was expected or understood to be short term. Climate action seems longer term, so less likely to attract acceptance, question mark. Mm -hmm. um, interesting question, Marlene. I think that that's, the, the crises are very different and I was aware of that in my research. Um, I wanted to make the case for um, understanding that climate action, even though we have this like longevity attached to it, it's not really, we can't be, be thinking in that longevity anymore. 
um, because it's so dire now and we need that 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 investment now for long-term thinking and so i think that's that's the difference there no longer operating on like a short-term scale we have to be thinking much longer term um which requirement requires um upfront in, like investment now um for what is going to only get worse if that makes sense um and then nyla um no, Nyla, uh, this imaginative futures exercise, all great ideas, but can we have any real impact on policy? That's a great question. Um, how am I, as a facilitator, going to use all your lovely reflections and turn that into something? And um, my idea is to get this workshop in front of as many people with influence as possible. Um, that's one piece that I'm trying to do to mobilize my own research. Um, I will share the PDF with. Mario as well. So you have those ideas top of mind. Um, so staying up to date on as, as kind of silly as it sounds, but like Mario says, we need that collective pressure. And so how are we staying um, active in climate circles? How are we sending emails and calling our MPs and making this known that it's a priority? Um, and whether that's petitions, mobilizing together, um, sending emails, gathering in spaces, targeting people that you know with power and influence. And I think that we know people in all of our spaces. And so that's that's one goal that we can do. Just to add to this very quickly, um, various people spoke about the impact, the power of imagination. Picasso said, everything you can imagine is real. Albert Einstein said, logic will get you from A to B, imagination will take you everywhere. So, and that everywhere before we know um, how to get there, we have to know and believe that it exists and we have to be able to envision it um, collectively because that's how we can birth it into reality and birth our future selves into uh, that new place that uh, will bring into being together. So um, yeah, once again, thank you. Beautiful questions. Um, I'm just going to take the time to read some of the recent questions here. Yeah, yeah. All uh, beautiful reflections, and, and I'm just encouraging in the last few minutes anyone who may have uh, another thought or question please write it in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and contribute as well. Okay. Hmm. Like the idea of the um, 16 climate vigils. That's really cool. Thanks for sharing that. Hmm. Visiting your neighbors. Speaking with your vote. And something that I can speak to from an experience in the work of climate justice is that many uh, politicians and especially parliamentarians are susceptible um, during times of election and as you know, we have a federal election coming up, uh, not this October, the October after that. And in some provinces like BC, there is um, there are provincial elections even sooner. So these are really strategic windows of opportunity where you can amplify your voice, your demands, um, and uh, step forward with a community of constituents uh, to make this as um, and it, it will land uh, with more weight than it usually does on a non-election year. So keep that in mind also when you're speaking to politicians around this time. Okay. We won't keep you any longer. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, thanks to each and every one of you, whether you're watching live or you're watching the recording. Uh, for spending your valuable time with us this evening. Julia, it was truly really a pleasure to hear you speak 
and to learn so much from you uh, and from this unique framing. Thinking about the climate crisis in this way enables me and I hope all of us to expand the horizon of what's possible in terms of climate action, what's feasible. Um, and it also empowers us to be less susceptible to all the policymakers who tell us that it just cannot be done when it clearly can uh, be done. Um, we just need this radical imagining. Uh, we need the hope that uh, comes with collective action, such as our gathering this evening. Um, and we need you, all of you who showed up um, and again, dedicated your time and energy to being here this evening because our work is uh, grounded in the courage vision and uh, commitment and compassion of folks like you towards creation, care, and climate action. Um, thanks again to the organizers. Thanks to For the Love of Creation for being a valuable partner. Um, and uh, of course, Citizens for Public Justice for sponsoring this workshop as a part of this year's Give It Up for the Earth, as I already mentioned two times. Please do uh, watch our uh, Eco Spirituality in Action webinar. The, uh, links will be dropped in the chat for one last time. Uh, please do sign our um, open letter to Minister Gibbo calling for a stronger, stronger federal climate uh, action. This is how we get your voice across to politicians on Parliament Hill. Um, and once again, being able to secure these meetings, we, we meet with Minister Gibbo and we hand over these, uh, or we'll try to hand over these um, signatures in person. Uh, he's a very busy person in the government, as you probably know. Um, but uh, this is how we ensure that your voice is heard, and this is how we convey the deep and unwavering commitment of faith communities and justice minded individuals towards uh, creation, care, and climate action in Canada. So, once again, we thank you uh, in advance for all of your work. I'm just going to uh, share the resources. Once again, we hope you'll stay up to date uh, with uh, the work of Citizens for Public Justice, with the work of For the Love of Creation, um, and your local climate organization as well. Thank you, and uh, you should expect the recording of this webinar to be in your inbox sometime soon. Have a lovely rest of your night. Take care. Take care, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.